Right. Yes. Uh, thank you, Frank. And uh, let's uh, pray to start with. Yeah. Thank you, Heavenly Father. You are in charge here. There's uh, much uh, stuff to cover, and uh, I pray that I will do it justice, and uh, that I will speak your words, and uh, that everyone here will be blessed. I pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to be here and working, and yeah, that, that you will be glorified through this time, and uh, everyone will, here would get something from it to take away and ponder on and affect their lives in a deep and meaningful way. Uh, thank you, Lord. Amen. Right. So, if you weren't here last time, um, we were looking at, well, we are looking at baptism. And um, last time we looked at two points of baptism, uh, ceremonial washing and the baptism of Moses. So this time, I want to take a little bit deeper into uh, the waters of baptism. And uh, we're going to look at um, baptism by John the Baptist. Uh, then specifically the baptism of Jesus. Of course, that was done by John as well. And then briefly mention uh, the baptism by Jesus' disciples. So first of all, I'm just going to... If in a sense, take a, a look back on, what, on a part of what we did uh, last week, which was um, into the ceremonial washing side of things. And I, I just wanted to bring a little bit more clarity um, on, on this from the Strong's Concordance, um, primarily because I think to this sort of distinguishes, the Greek language is quite helpful here. It distinguishes different types of washing and um, and so um, Philip is going to bring up the um, some of the words here. There are several words for washing in the Greek, um, and only two of them are reserved for um, for ceremonial washing, which is quite helpful if we think about it. Um, we've got the first one here, which um, Philip is highlighting, is nipto, um, which is this. Uh, the passage we were looking at last time, we were looking at the different types of ceremonial washing, um, and it was distinguishing, you know, that they, you know, when we were talking about baptism and the sort of the dipping of pitches and that sort of thing. Well, this is what, in that same passage, um, it's using nipto as well, and it's talking about ceremonial washing. Um, but if you look at what the definition is on the right of for nipto, you've got to cleanse, especially the hands or the feet or the face. So, oh. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, it's, so it's sort of indicating here partial ceremonial washing. So hands, feet, face, and notice very much it's ceremonially done. Um, rather, so it's slightly different from baptis, uh, baptizo, which we'll look at in a minute. But yeah, sort of very much sort of like partial washing. Um, and it says here to compare to luo, uh, which um, Philip's going to click on the definition for luo, which is um, now luo is uh, is basically a normal non um, ceremonial washing. Um, so it's, it's as you see it says here it's to bathe the whole person. So this is sort of in a sense full washing. Um, whereas nipto, and this is quite useful here because it clarifies that nipto, which is one we were looking at before, uh, is to wet a part only. So it's only partial ceremonial washing. So it really does clarify that, that this is partial ceremonial washing. Uh, uh, and there are clearly, there are other type words for washing, which we're not going to go into, but you've, you can see there the other description also goes into pluno, if that's how it's uh, using the right pronunciation, uh, you know, to wash good car uh, garments. Again, that's just general washing. So there's lots of words for washing, which is quite helpful if you think about it when we're trying to sort of understand what the Bible actually has to say. Uh, the other word that's uh, in there, of course, that we know is uh, baptizo. Um, and as we looked at last week, it is uh, to immerse, 
to submerge, uh, to make whelmed, which is like to fully wet. Um, and it's used in the New Testament of ceremonial uh, washing or ablution, um, especially technically of the ordinance of Christian baptism. So it's very specific that there's a difference here between, um, uh, between nepto and baptizo. Okay, nepto being partial ceremonial washing, baptizo being a, um, a full immersion. Um, and the reason, of course, we bring this up is because there's always that controversial question mark over, you know, is sprinkling really what the Bible is trying to allude to or, or is proper Im immersion the right word? And I think it's brilliant. Um, uh, as, we, as Philip and I were looking at this, we sort of noticed that the, the Greek words uh, are there and they've got the different definitions. And, um, and of course, when we're talking about like John's baptism or, you know, uh, any of the baptisms in the Bible, when it talks about the Holy Spirit or whatever, it's, it, it's using baptizo, which is full immersion and not some kind of, uh, you know, little wetting or washing of hands and face and so forth. Um, and also what the reason to um, to bring this up is because I think also you see other, when we look at the other passages, um, there's more hints, which I'll point out as we go along, that it really is, you know, for proper, proper immersion. Um, right. So... So, yeah, it's a really good answer for, for that question, even just off the bat. Um, but we're now going to look um, at the baptism by John the Baptist. OK, but for, if, as I look at the baptism of John, by John the Baptist, I need to sort of set the scene. Because one of the questions we've not asked is, um, where does baptism actually come from? I don't know whether anyone's actually even thought of this. Now, we, of course, we'd say, well, the Bible. But with, what I mean is, before we had all this John doing his stuff, what was before that? Why did John suddenly, seemingly, start, you know, dipping people in the Jordan? Um, so I sort of did a little bit of digging around. I may probably not have got a massive, you know, full-on picture of, of what was going on here. But... What I found was that in Jerusalem, there are um, what are called a mikvot, which, are, which is the plural word for mikvah, uh, which is a Hebrew word. And these, are, the, these, uh, these mikvot are outside the temple. They are, um, in fact, do you want to show the picture? They look like this. Um, now, there's different types, um, but basically, as you can see, they allow the person to sort of step into this pool and, um, and to wash. So clearly you can, get a, you can get your whole body in there um, and or whatever you want to, 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 to be washed. Um, so let me just find my place. So, yes, these are outside the temple, um, and the, um, so we actually have archaeological evidence. I'm not sure whether this one, this one's probably, this picture's probably taken at Qumran or somewhere like that, but the, the, yeah, there are actually ones outside the temple. Now, they're interesting that they're there, um, because they, um, you know, we've not, there, there's no kind of sort of biblical reference to them in the sense of you know well clearly they're part of the sort of the original temple design uh, that, that that God gave to Solomon nor are they part of the kind of the um, the, the you know the, the instructions given to Moses when he's built you know for the tabernacle and the, and the furnishings and so forth um, but yes they allowed for people to wash and fully submerge their body and they also were used for various things um, and for various sort of ritual uh, purification. Um, so they kind of make sense. And I'll, I'll show you how the, sort of the, the logic joins up. Um, 
So, although, so we've got the archaeological evidence, but what we really have, they're still used today. They're still used by the Jews today when they're doing ceremonial washing. You've got modern versions of this, which you know, look like swimming pool type versions, you know. Um, and th they have a definition of what they use these for, which is probably, you can pretty, pretty be, be pretty sure that there's kept this logic through the ages. Um, they use these uh, today for um, various things, preparation just before marriage. So it's not like this washing before, before someone was to be married. Um, also after menstruation or childbirth, which in kind of, again sort of ties in with that sort of whole bodily fluids and you know cleaning away. Um, also to immerse a body as part of preparation for burial, which is interesting. Um, and the other one, which is interesting, is they use them um, when they're converting, when people were converting to Judaism. Again, you know, where does that come from in the Bible? No, nowhere. But it's, this is this is the uh, well, these these are sort of these these are the picture anyway. We will revisit these later. Um, there, as I say, there's, yeah, we don't know much about them, um, but in terms of exactly when they were introduced, for example. But the, the, a possible guess is that they were introduced after return from the exile. So perhaps when they come back from exile, um, you know, back into Israel, um, then the priests were ruling. And maybe that was when they decided that, uh, that, this, that this would be a good idea. As you can imagine, um, they would be really useful to have, um, you know, in and around Jerusalem. Um, but of course, there's also further clues um, um, why they're useful, because we've looked at the modern definition, but we also have the biblical pattern, the mosaic from the mosaic law about when they should wash their body. And, um, and this, I'll just recap some of those for you. Uh, this was when they were, when someone was unclean or had contact with something that was unclean. Um, and examples of this were when a, le uh, a leper had been healed, um, so then he would wash. Um, then you've got uh, a woman uh, uh, when, her, when she ends her monthly period or flow of blood or any type of blood. Um, then you've got a man um, when there's an emission of semen. Uh, and you've got contact with an unclean animal. Um, and then you've got a dead, uh, also contact with a dead person or a, a dead animal. Uh, and interestingly, also, if they ate what died naturally or what was torn by beasts. So they've got this in the Mosaic law. So you can see how the sort of the logic flow through to having these mikvah uh, or having a mikvah by the temple would be really useful because surely that's going to be in reasonably regular use. So hopefully I've given you a picture of, of the sort of the scene, if you like, that, that John the Baptist and everyone at that time is sort of walking into. You see the, the picture they've got in their minds of, of what this what John is actually doing, what he's you know, symbolizing. But we'll look into the, the symbolism of it. OK, do you want to turn to Matthew chapter three? We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 3 a few times. So it's the beginning of uh, Matthew chapter 3. First, we'll just read the first couple of verses to start with. It says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So I'll just pause there for a minute. So as John starts his ministry, you know, he is preparing the way for Jesus. Importantly, he is, he is calling people to repentance. He's saying, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We'll see this actually quite a few times as, as I as I talk today. Um, and Jesus himself, we'll see later, 
he repeats this same call when he starts his ministry. So there's this sort of John laying the foundation of repentance and baptism, which then Jesus takes on. Verse 5, so miss, miss a couple of verses, um, and we read on, and it says, um, Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptised by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when they saw many of the Pharisees, or when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptise you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Powerful words from Don. So what's going on here? Let's summarise or go through it. So all these people from the area are coming to John. Uh, interestingly, they're being baptised in the River Jordan, which again is this thing about immersion in the sense of, well, why would you bother going into the, the river? Um, so, you know, unless, you know, if it was just a sprinkling, then you could do that on the bank or anywhere. But clearly they're going into the river. Um, they are importantly confessing and repenting of their sins. Of course, we see confession and repentance all over the place. But here we see it in, in you know, related to baptism. It's sort of the prelude, prelude or whatever the word is for baptism. There's this requirement um, before we get baptised you know, that we've that we've confessed our sins to the Lord, that we've actually said, right, you know, I'm not having anything to do with my old life. I'm repenting. I'm changing my mind. I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do things God's way. I'm not going to do things my way anymore. And they're doing this. And yes, baptism symbolizes it, but you've got to actually take that action first. And then you, then you may be baptised. And of course, John severely rebukes the Pharisees um, because they don't have repentant hearts. Their hearts are not kind of like, I'm going to go God's way. Their hearts are, are you know, I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> and of course, John sees this and, um, you know, and rebukes them very severely and basically tells them, go away and get that sorted out before you come back. Um, yeah, John warns the people, if they don't bear fruit worthy of repentance, then they will be thrown into the fire. And, uh, and that Jesus will be the one who will burn the unrepentant with unquenchable fire. So there's actually something to be afraid of here for them. Okay, so another question that I thought would be an interesting one is why on earth the River Jordan? And you may be able to immediately think of some reasons why John is baptising in the Jordan. Uh, the most obvious one, the first thought I had um, was that the, uh, the faithful Israelites uh, passed through the Jordan into the Promised Land. Now this of course is very similar but somewhat different to the crossing of the Red Sea. Um, I'm going to sort of do a summary here of, uh, of what the crossing of the Jordan because it sort of covers over multiple chapters. It's chapters 
3 to 5 of, of, of the book of Joshua. Um, so I'm not going to read uh, that many chapters out to you. <laughs> um, so the situation that they find themselves in when they kind of get to the, the Jordan, finally after they've been wandering around in the, in the wilderness, is um, that the previous rebellious generation who had never really obeyed God um, properly, apart from Joshua and Caleb, who were the ones who were the only ones that were still alive. Um, but all the rest had, had passed away, they'd all died. And what happens is that the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant uh, are told um, to stand uh, in the edge of the Jordan. And at this point, the water stops flowing up higher up uh, in the, in the uh, somewhere up the, up the river and apparently gathers in a heap. And this is interesting, uh, even though it was harvest flood season, that it's interesting why choose flood season to go and try and cross the river. It's a bit silly, isn't it? But God is obviously revealing his glory, saying, you know, I'm going to do it to just prove the point. Um, and, and then yet again, uh, like with, uh, the, you know, the crossing of the Red Sea, um, the land is, is dry and the, um, the people, or the priests, sorry, with the ark, they stand in the middle of the Jordan and, uh, and then the people cross over in, on, um, on dry ground. And this also symbolizes yet again, this is a similar symbolism, you know, the, the ark is going ahead of them to start with, and then he's sort of, you know, standing guard while they pass by, and then he kind of, uh, the priests come up and out, um, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, they're all over on the other side, and as soon as the priests carrying the ark are on the other side, the water returns to its usual um, flood levels. Uh, interesting also, I'm not going to make much of it, but the, the new generation are then circumcised um, because it's notes that they hadn't been circumcised before. And there is always a question, there's also a question which we'll probably cover another time about, you know, has, you know, has baptism replaced circumcision? So it's important to mention here that, um, that, that they were then circumcised at that point. It's interesting that they hadn't been circumcised when they were wandering in the, in the wilderness. I'm not sure why that was. So it was the first symbolic baptism, if you like, for the new generation. So yeah, all the all the previous lot had died in the wilderness. The new generation are uh, effectively going through their baptism, their dedication to the Lord, and um, and in a sense here it symbolises what I would call true Israel. Um, as they entered the promised land, these are the these are the faithful generation. You know, the previous were unfaithful. This is the faithful generation, and to me, that's true Israel. You know, what God, the people that God really is looking for. So, in order to sort of look at this a bit, we'll look at Romans chapter nine, verses six to eight. Uh, it says, For they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, um, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. So the children of the flesh are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. In a word here, which ties in with, with what I was saying before about this Jordan crossing, is that uh, he is saying that those who are truly part of God's promise are true Israel. And these are, in fact, the ones who are actually faithful to God. They're not living after the flesh, um, 
but they're living after the promise. You see, they hopefully you see the, the comparison there. So yeah, these are the ones that are faithful to God, and Jordan represents the ones that are faithful to God. So that's the, my first thinking about Jordan. A second one, which one might argue could put first because it happens first in the. Uh, um, no, that's not right. It happens second. Forget that. Uh, second thought on why the River Jordan, as we get me getting muddled up. Um, turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. Yeah, because it's in Kings. It's not, it's not before. So there you go. <laughs> uh, we start, we're going to look at from verse uh, 9. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 9 to 14. Um, so this is the story of Elisha and Naaman, which you may have thought of as a, another Jordan-related passage. Uh, Naaman was the commander of the army for the king of Syria, so not an, uh, a Jew or not an Israelite, which makes it interesting from our perspective as, also as Gentiles. So yeah, 2 Kings 5, 9 to 14. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I, my, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not, are not the Abner and the Farpar, if I pronounce them right, the rivers of Damascus better in, than all the rivers of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored, like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Yes, it's an amazing demonstration here um, of the first sort of, in a sense, baptism, in it, the first real baptism, if you like, and it's a Gentile. Um, I, I just love, I love the, the, you know, the way God just loves to sort of you know, use Elisha to, to, to do this and, 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 and make it relevant to us. Um, yeah, so it, this, the baptism is, is clearly representing for both the Jew and the Gentile, which I think you know, is really powerful. Um, yeah, he went, it says he went down and dipped seven times into the Jordan. So I should mention this again, there's this dipping um, rather than sprinkling. Yet again, another indication of immersion, and uh, so just bring that up. And it says, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. I love this because it's like, it sort of symbolizes being reborn. So here is this Gentile being reborn. And yeah, so I think all of this really shows you why the Jordan was relevant. Okay, to sort of summarise this John's baptism, uh, we're going to get look back now at the mikveh like we started with. And I want you to imagine the people coming to John. I think I've probably set the scene a bit already, but imagine the people coming to John. Uh, imagine um, how they would be um, thinking about what John was doing in terms of the mikveh. So we mentioned before that a mikveh was used uh, as a ritual purification bath. 
So if they were, if the people were coming were thinking uh, about it, they would be recognizing that they were basically saying that they were unclean and that they were dishonoring God. A mikveh was used to immerse the body as part of the preparation for burial. So they would also be identifying, uh, symbolizing with burial of their old life as what we've looked at before, but they would be, they should be thinking that that was part of what they were doing, or they may be able to identify with that. Uh, also, mikveh was used when converting to Judaism. So they were effectively rejecting, uh, well, at least this is why I take it, they were effectively rejecting the hypocrisy of the religious leaders at the time. I mean, Jesus rebukes the religious leaders and saying, look, they say do this, do that, do the other, but they don't actually do it themselves. Um, and so there's a sense here in which, you know, this conversion to Judaism is that's what we're talking about before, this true Israel, this sort of decision to sort of, no, I'm going to be true Israel, if you like. And so they're rejecting the, the what's false and deciding to go God's way. Also, we've got the mikveh was used um, before marriage. Um, so I think this is good, too, because they were effectively symbolizing the fact that they were getting ready to be married to the Lord. Which, of course, is, you know, is like us. You know, there are, we're, we're currently in... Um, uh, what do you call it? When betrothal stage, uh, and then obviously there'll be the you know there'll be the marriage at the end, and so I think that you know again powerful uh, symbolism just from the fact that these mikvah are around. Right. Okay. So now let's move on and let's look at the baptism of Jesus by John. I don't know whether you've still got your finger in Matthew three. Possibly not by now, but uh, if you want to go back there. I'm going to carry on reading from, I think, where we finished, as far as I remember. Yeah, 13, yeah, that's right. And 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It's the most amazing thing, and it is it's actually quite difficult. One thing I'll say here, um, it's actually quite difficult to use this passage. And I'm obviously going to later, I'm going to talk about the baptism of the cross. And unfortunately, if you like, the two are very heavily linked together. So some of the comments I might make will be alluding to stuff that I'm going to cover later, um, which will be related to the symbolism of the cross. And you'll probably see that a little bit as we as we go through. OK, but let's have a look at this passage and uh, what's happening. So first we see that Jesus is coming to be baptized by John, which on the surface, I think, to all of us seems a little bit strange. Why does it seem strange? Well, John's baptism is a baptism of repentance. Do you think Jesus needed to repent of anything? So even John is unsure. He, you know, surely I need to be baptized by you, he says. Jesus' reply is uh, that it was to fulfill all righteousness. Uh, so clearly Jesus is at least saying that 
it was therefore right in God's sight and necessary to make everything kind of complete, to fulfill everything, to, to do everything that Jesus needed to do. And the question is, why? Um, now, these are some of my thoughts here. Jesus, you know, perhaps I may be able to bring out more another time, but um, Jesus is our forerunner um, in, in, in many ways. He, he sort of sets, our, sets the pattern for what we should do. Uh, you know, he, he's, the, he's the replacement for the old Adam and the old way and the, the way of sin. And, you know, he's, he is the first resurrection, for example. You know, he's the, he's the first to be raised. And, uh, and, and here he is the first. Um, um, I'm trying to say it the right way. Like he is Jesus. He is baptized. Obviously, we get baptized into Jesus. Um, and so. He is sort of showing us the way that, you know, it is the pattern that we should follow. Uh, that we're baptised into him. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's that side of it. Uh, yeah, so we should be baptised as, as, as a point uh, that he's saying. Um, obviously, from last week, we, we were talking about how baptism symbolised death, burial and resurrection. And... Um, and as I say, what we're looking at next, uh, late, probably maybe next week, next, well, not next week, the next time I'm talking, um, we'll be looking at how that fits together. Um, but he is, Jesus is identifying with the fact that he has died to himself. Uh, of course, he was always dead to himself uh, throughout his entire life. He didn't do what he wanted. He was completely obedient to the Father and he only did what the Father wanted. Uh, so, okay, notice also um, that Jesus said, that, that it says that Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him. Again, if we just see that bit, it reads like, you know, he's sort of below the water, immediately comes up and the heavens are open to him. Uh, you could, you can read it possibly in another way, but again, it reads like he was dipped. Uh, there was a dipping there, so sort of immersion, which I obviously I'm continually bringing out. Um, also, we, if we, I don't know whether you want to turn, you can turn if you like, or have it on the screen. John three twenty three. And it says, now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. So again, I'm, maybe I'm over egging the, 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 the same point, apologies, but it says there was much water there. And why would you need much water unless, um, you know, you're doing um, immersion? So there's another clue. I'm just trying to give you a full picture, uh, an answer, if you like, to, to, to that question. Um, another thing that's quite interesting is it's kind of ties in also with what we were looking at last week. Um, when we because we were talking about, you know, the priestly line. So we're talking about us being priests and maybe I should bring up. Um, I haven't brought the verse here, but I think it's in Hebrews or somewhere where it talks about Jesus being, our, you know, being the the great high priest. Um, but what I want to say here is that John was of the tribe of Levi. So hopefully he's going to bring up, or do you want to look at Luke chapter 1, verse 5? So yeah, so John was the tribe of, tribe of Levi. And not only was he a tribe of Levi, but as we said before, there's a difference between being part of the tribe of Levi and also being a priest because obviously that was just Aaron and his sons, they were priests. But he wasn't just a tribe of Levi, he was also of the priestly line. And this is demonstrated in uh, Luke chapter 1 verse 5, where it's talking here about uh, John's father, uh, Zacharias. And it says, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. Of the division of Abijah, Abid, Abid, I can't say it. 
Abijah. Abijah, thank you. <laughs> His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So very priestly, <laughs> for sure. So why do I mention this here? Well, it seems to me that John is also acting in a priestly office. Uh, all these people, of course, are coming to, to John um, repenting. So, it's, and we, we obviously have seen the symbolism of baptism, and we've seen that um, essentially they are like coming as living sacrifices, which we know from the New Testament. Um, and they are saying that they're coming and they're repenting of their old ways and they're, they're going to go God's way. And this is the baptism of John. And so, you know, the priest would make the sacrificial offering on the altar. It's very symbolic, this, I think, really. Um, and, and so, yeah, John would be, uh, sorry, the priest would be making these, this sacrifice on the altar. And these sacrifices seem to be the people that are coming to him. Uh, I may be overdoing it. You, I may be reading too much in there, but that's the picture I get. Uh, maybe there are sort of scriptures you could sort of tie all together to kind of to say that. And again, in my own opinion, when Jesus comes, it's a, it's it to me it's like G, uh, John is performing this priestly presentation of the ultimate sacrifice. Um, you know, again, it's heavily symbolic. And I apologize that this is my opinion, but I think you probably will see that it's, it, it seems to fall out of, of what's going on. Um, and, you know, the, the, very, the very symbolism of baptism is, is showing you know, this death and burial and resurrection. And, do you know, that the whole symbolism and this sacrifice being made, and uh, which is why it ties in with the cross and, again, what we'll look at next time, hopefully. Uh, so it said, so we got one uh, John one twenty nine. Uh, the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, "Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world." Yes. So as a sacrifice, thank you, Philip. That's great. Yes. Here is the true Lamb of God, the Lamb of the sacrifice who will be taking away the sins of the, of the world, which, in a sense, uh, John is offering um, through the baptism. Also, which ties in here as well, is John was passing the torch. So and we'll look at some passages here, but um, actually, yeah, we'll look at, let's look at John 3.30. Very briefly, he's saying he's, um, it just says that or, um, John is saying about Jesus that the no, sorry, let me get this right. Mm -hmm. Yes, John is saying about Jesus that Jesus must increase, so he must increase, but I must decrease. So John is saying that he must decrease. Um, there is this distinct, obviously, we know that John prepared the way for Jesus. And there was this sense in which John sets the scene and and then eventually he starts to decrease and Jesus takes over. OK. Um, we know that also that after Jesus's baptism, what did he well, what did he then go and do? He then he was then tempted in the wilderness. Uh, and then soon after that. He took up exactly the same message that John was, was making, uh, which I mentioned before. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, this shows this sort of passing of the torch. And also, sort of, you get the impression here that baptism of, of Jesus, in a sense, starts off his ministry. There are certain aspects which start off his ministry. One of them is his baptism. Um, and, and obviously, when he starts going and preaching the message of the kingdom of heaven and uh, calling people to repentance, exactly the same as what uh, John did, which is very important. It's the same message. It's not a different message. Uh, 
Okay, so then the passage also says, our, our main passage, says that when uh, Jesus came up from the water, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is a lovely bit of scripture. Um, so this is one of the few passages in the Bible where we actually really do see the Trinity all together. And that, well, it's amazing, actually, that it, the Trinity is displayed at Jesus' baptism. That says something in and of itself. This, I think there's a much greater depth here than I'm, than I'm aware of. Uh, so I apologise if I'm not doing it justice. <laughs> The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are gloriously resounding together. So clearly God thinks baptism is very important. <laughs> and as we have seen, you know, this is uh, the ultimate pattern of salvation and the Christian life. You know, throughout our lives, we, it is how we become a Christian. Uh, in the terms of symbolically and in practice by the act of baptism and uh, and ultimately the repeating action of dying to self and being alive in Christ um, as we as we go through our Christian walk okay so sort of finally in a sense um, we're just going to briefly look at the baptism of Jesus's disciples or baptism by Jesus's disciples I should say um, uh, ultimately, of course, um, Jesus' disciples baptised both before the death of Jesus and after. Uh, we will look at um, the book of Acts and that side of it later because very often you've got water and spirit baptism together and I probably need to cover spirit baptism first. Uh, so let's just look at John 4 verses 1 to 3. It says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptised more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptise, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. So the reason I mention this is, first of all, we see that Jesus did not baptise, but it was his disciples that were doing the baptising. And maybe there are various reasons, again, that I, I'm not aware of, of why it was the disciples. But one point that's made is that um, well, one point that's made later, even, and maybe I could have brought this in, uh, you've got the whole argument of, of, of you know, the disciples baptising and this whole thing, oh, I was being baptised by so-and-so and I'm blah, I was baptised, and, you know, where, and so Jesus, of course, is completely avoiding this, completely avoiding this, this issue. Oh, I was baptised by Jesus, I'm better than you. <laughs> and yeah, so the focus is on the baptism then and not the baptizer. You're not the focus is in the right place, and and, Je and Jesus, of course, is doing the preaching. If you like, he's so he's the one saying, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." Um, so we can presume that the disciples were also baptizing people into repentance, which would which makes sense, um, indeed. Uh, we're looking at because there's people there are lots of people that end up in different situations as a result of this that oh i've only received the baptism of john oh i've only received the baptism of jesus before he was before he was crucified or you know all of these sorts of things so there's loads of people in lots of different states uh, when we come to when we come to the book of acts uh, which we will do eventually but that may be a few weeks away okay i'm going to end there and um i hope you've been blessed by that giving you a better picture and i'm going to pray close 
you know. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you again for this powerful um, symbolism of baptism. Thank you, Jesus, that you showed us the way. Thank you, Jesus, that you brought glory to yourself by being baptised and you revealed your part of the Trinity there. And and, uh, and thank you that you baptise us into repentance. Thank you that it is that our old lives are being put to death and that we have new lives in you. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to die each day to ourselves and to be alive in you. May you, by your Holy Spirit, be alive in us and uh, drawing us to yourself and enabling us to be more like you. We thank and we praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen.